Hello, and welcome to Off the Cuff with Suzanne. My name is Suzanne Bryan, and I'm a knitter. I'm a TKGA certified master hand knitter. TKGA stands for the Knitting Guild Association. They have a master hand knitting program that I went through, and I attribute uh, most of my um, knitting good fortune since then to going through that program. So this is number one of Suzanne Off the Cuff. The person who came up with that name was Deborah Cisneros. She mentioned it during my last live stream on my other YouTube channel, and it just resonated with me so much I decided to choose that name. I've been thinking for quite some time of creating a second channel because the majority of my videos are short and to the point and most of my subscribers have subscribed to my YouTube channel because that's the format that they really like. Personally, I like when I want to learn something new. I also like to watch a video that's short and to the point. I don't want to sit through all the talking and background information. I just want to go right to it, cut to the chase, and see what I want to see. Um, so that's the type of videos that I make. But since this, a couple of months ago and the knit-alongs that we're doing, the ITAG, which stands for It Takes a Guild, sweater knit alongs that we've been doing, I decided to start live streaming so that I can answer folks' questions about the process we're going through and give you more personalized one-on-one -on -one attention. So I combined that with my other channel. So I was doing the short videos plus the live streams, and I don't think that it appeals to all of the subscribers. So I thought I would peel off the live stream onto a new channel. So this is it. Suzanne off the cuff. So this channel will only contain my live stream uh, YouTube videos. The other channel, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, will still contain all of my video tutorials. The previous live streams will stay over there because I can't really move them over here. So there you have it. That's the background in a nutshell. And for some reason right now, I'm not able to see the chat, which I can usually see over to the right side of my screen. I know that people are chatting because I can see that there are people on here. So let me investigate that a little bit. Um, are you all seeing any chat? I hope, <laughs> I hope there is some chat going on. If not, I'll have to do this a little bit differently next time. Somebody who has my um, text phone number, send me a text and let me know whether you're seeing live chat on this um, YouTube live stream. I chose, there's different formats you can use for setting this up and it's the, the uh, bandwidth. Um, if you have a higher bandwidth, you have more delay between the comments and the actual video. The lower the bandwidth, the less delay there is. So I chose, usually I choose the one with the middle bandwidth, but this time I chose the one with the lower bandwidth and that may have been a mistake, I don't know. So somebody who knows my, um, Phone number, send me a text, please. Oh, here we go. Top right corner, the chat is showing, thank you. So what I need to do, hold on here, I'm going to also put this up on a different browser so that I can see the chat. Hang on for a second, because I wanna be able to answer your questions. That's what this is all about. Let's see, switch account. Okay. Go to my channel and the live stream. Live now. And I see the chat. Yay! So I can move that browser over here behind this one. Aren't computers wonderful? Yay! Okay, I got it fixed. Yay! Okay, now let me move my screen around so I can see you all, or see, get this centered. Sorry. 
you know, there's always something that's got to be changed, you know? It's just how it is. But thank goodness for computers. Isn't this wonderful? Okay, so now over in the live chat, which is over to the right for most people, you can ask me questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please, please preface your question with the word question in all caps. That makes it stand out and it's easier for me to find. So welcome to my very first live stream on this channel. This is the inaugural one. And I plan to do these twice a week on Sunday, 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, every Sunday, unless I'm going to be out of town or I have a prior commitment that interferes. And then also every Wednesday at noon Pacific Standard Time. These will usually be about an hour long, so you can plan for that. Just put it in your calendar if you want to come back and join me again. Now, since this is brand new, I only have like, you know, a few hundred subscribers on here right now versus 35,000. So when I sent the notification out for this, it only went to a few people. So please take a moment. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, right about here, there is an arrow going that way. And that means share. If you click on that arrow, there's a, a web address that you can copy and you can paste it into any of your social media groups. And you can do that right now. That would help me a whole lot. And it would alert people that we're doing this. And maybe they will figure out that, yes, I have this second channel. So it's going to be a little bit of a learning curve and getting everybody to come on over here from the other channel. So I have some things to talk about today. I do have some Ravelry questions to answer. One of them was really interesting. She wanted to know if on the Starry Starry Night so stocks, if she, socks, if she could put in a steak down the edge here and add a zipper because she wants to make them for a person who is disabled and it's very hard for them to get socks on and off. That is a fantastic idea. If you were going to do that, I would do it in this area right here and maybe follow this line over here, down to about here. And I would add more stripes. So a steak is can be anywhere, it's usually an odd number, it doesn't have to be, but I, I usually make mine odd numbers. And I would probably add seven stitches. So the center, so you're gonna have three stitches on each side of the steak and the seventh center one is gonna be where you're going to cut. And then you could put a zipper in. I would make it down to right about here. So that would allow you to, following this line right here, that would allow you to slip it on the person's foot very easily and zip it up. Of course, then you want to get a soft a zipper um, and maybe even put something on the inside edge of the zipper fabric to keep it from like maybe a satin ribbon or something so the zipper doesn't actually rub on their foot because that might be uncomfortable. So that was a great question. And there were a couple more questions. I'll have to zip back over there and look again since I changed my browser. So I have one here right away on our new chat and it is from Jane Hart. And she says, question, Suzanne, since learning to do feral knitting from your wristlet pattern, would you please explain yarn dominance and holding the two yarn strands in the left hand dominant yarn on top? Yes. So um, actually, these socks are a good example of, I'm gonna turn a little bit of light on here. Um, the weather we're having, you have a window here, that's where I get natural light here, and then I have a light in my room. Um, but it's getting very, very overcast and like we're gonna have a big storm outside, so the light outside's not coming in very well. So I added my little lamp here. Okay, let's look at these socks. This is a good example of yarn dominance versus this sock. The soles look very different, don't they? And so do the heels. So do you see this definite line right here? And this line right here, it's not so bad on this one because it was the second sock I made. These are all interesting things. So in the very first sock I made, um, the blue was the dominant color. That's my stars was in the blue. 
But when I was working the heel from right here to right here, this part of the heel right here, you're actually working flat. So you're working back and forth and not in the round. The rest of it's in the round. And if you don't pay close attention to which yarn you're holding your hand in, in any case, but especially working flat, when you turn to work a wrong side row, it changes your yarn dominance. Do you see that? So here, the white almost looks like it's the dominant and the blue looks dominant over here. I bet you never noticed that on my socks before, did you? So the other sock, I noticed it. I did notice it when I made this sock. So in this sock, uh, <coughs> I paid attention. It's still there, but it's not as bad, okay? But again, the other thing is that between these two soles, um, of course, one is worked... Um, they're slightly off, but still between here and here, it's just stripes, right? Knit one of one color, knit one of the other color. In this sock, the blue yarn was held to the left. And in this sock, the white yarn was held to the left. And you can see that it makes a tremendous difference. So if you were holding one yarn, I'm gonna go through all three methods, okay? So if you're holding one yarn in each, and let me put some yarn on my needle. I got a needle in yarn, I'm prepared today. So let me put some stitches on here and I'll just show you how I hold yarns. Okay, so let's say and with that I'm going to hold one strand in each hand, okay? These are two completely different weights of yarn, but you'll get the idea. If I hold one yarn in each hand, And I'm gonna knit like this, right? The one, the yarn that's in my left hand will be the dominant color. And you're seeing the pearl side of my work, but it doesn't really matter. So this will be the dominant color. This is the non-dominant color. Now let's say I held both the yarns in my left hand. The one that's to the left, can you see? The dark blue, here's the light blue. Actually, you can separate them. Here's the dark blue, here's the light blue, okay? The dark blue is to the left. I mean the light blue. I mixed up my words. The light blue is to the left. So if you go to make a stitch with the light blue, that is going to be the dominant color. Let me get my tension a little bit better. So we're gonna make a stitch with the light blue. That's the dominant color. And then if I switch, which yarn I'm gonna use, this the dark blue, I'm pulling it up from underneath and it's still to the left. Knitting up in the air like this is not easy. But when it comes back into position down here, it's still to the left, okay? If I were gonna hold both yarns in this hand, and I wanted the light blue to be dominant. I hold them like this. I still separate them by a finger. Like this. Can you see that? So I'm holding, this would be the yarn to the left. This is the, the dark blue is the yarn to the right. So if I knit with the light blue, I'm picking the yarn to the left. And if I knit with the dark blue, I'm picking the yarn to the right. The yarn that is to the left, will always be dominant. And that's because when you're stranding, let me find some strands here. I dropped my yarn. Let's see. On this sock, the yellow was dominant, right? Because it's the design. So let's look at the inside of the sock. We can see in the stranding on the inside of the sock that the yellow is sitting below the green wherever it's stranded. Can you see that? The yellow is going below. The green is going above. Because the yellow is going below, it sits a micron lower. 
than the green, which makes the stitches look larger. You cannot detect it with your eye. You really can't. The stitches all look the same size, but it's enough that when you get a group of them together, like on this sole, here's the other sole. These haven't been blocked yet. But you can see the difference between the soles. Can you see that? This one looks more yellow. This one looks more green. And you can see that the green was the dominant color here. The yellow was the dominant color here. Can you see the difference between those two soles? It's hard to tell on the yellow. We can really tell in here. See in here where the green is more dominant here, the yellow is more dominant here. Does that answer your question, Jane? I hope so. Let's see, Lu Luana Hendricks, question. What was the tip you gave for stitches that sometimes disappear on the right side of the Starry Starry Night Socks? There, the tip is, it's a two-fold tip. Let's say you have some stitches that seem to disappear that are smaller. Like let's say one of your little diamond stitches is disappearing. Let's see if I can find one. I know there's some on there somewhere. Here's some. Okay, over here. See that top one's almost gone. Two things can be causing it. The first one is that the green stitches are too loose and this, so it makes them bulky and they push in on the yellow stitch. That could be the first cause. The second cause is that you could be holding the yellow yarn too tight. Your tension might be too tight on the yellow yarn. The most common is that your, your background yarn is too loose. So I would try tightening that up just a little bit first. If that doesn't fix the problem, then try loosening up the uh, foreground stitch, okay? Okay. <coughs> Hello, Margit from Germany. Hello. So, Sue Fuji says she just finished one Starry Starry Night Sock and it is lovely. One more to go. But in the meantime, I'm getting ready for the iTag Yoke cardigan. I am too. I'm getting ready for that too. So um, this week I made a new video on how to measure your body with special uh, attention for a yoke sweater. I also added more information in about um, measuring and making just uh, adjustments for bust size and waist shaping. And you know what? When I used that word... B-U-S-T, YouTube blocked me from uh, monetary gain until they personally hand reviewed it. Isn't that amazing? Um, I don't know. That's pretty picky. <laughs> it's not like we're doing anything racy here. It's just knitting, right? Okay. Wilson Street. Hello. And Tremoliers. Hello. Cindy McBride, hello. Jackie, hi. Francoise, hello, Francoise. Kathy Mashburn. Kathy Roosh, question. Hi, Kathy. Will you speak about swatching in the round for eye tag yoke, trying out multiple needles to get best fabric? Yes, I actually have a video on swatching in the round that I'll be giving you a link to, and you can try different um, stitch patterns. I mean, it's different, different needles. I didn't bring my swatch in here. I should. I might in a minute. Okay, yes, you're going to need to try different needles. And there's more to it uh, because if you're going to have a design element in the yoke, the design element that you pick might give you a different stitch gauge than your background fabric, which is going to be stockinette, right? So that's part of the learning on this one. We're going to be swatching just like we did on the sleeve and we swatched for all those cables and all that swatching we did last time. Guess what? We're gonna be doing more, doing more swatching. By the time you finish with me, you are going to be an expert at swatching. So that's my middle name, Swatch. Okay, Amy Schmaltz, hello. Urgen Artiju, hello. Champ Smith, hello. Marie, Vicky, Diana Danko, hello. Eric Joseph, Rana Shane. She says, hi, hi, love all the new tech progress you all have made to make it so helpful to us. Yes, I am learning so much. This has nothing to do with knitting, but everything to do with knitting. So 
it's a it's a huge learning curve. So uh, I'm learning a lot too. It's pouring rain out here right now. I mean, pouring. Usually in Bakersfield, we don't get much rain. And I've told you before, we have a standing joke that people will say, oh, we in Bakersfield, we get a two inch rain. That means there's two inches between the drops. And usually they evaporate soon after they hit the ground. But right now, um, it's coming down pretty good. That's good for us. Okay. Hello from London, Tanya, Signa Williams. Okay, so right now it looks like we have 78 people on here and 40 thumbs up. That's very cool. For beginning, this is the beginning, right? And be sure to share. Remember, I asked you to share the video, the link, because that helps for, there's going to be some people that are upset they didn't know about this. I tried to let as many avenues of people know um, before I started this, but you know, there's gonna be people that did not get a notification and they're gonna be upset. Hello, Kathy Troikowska. Okay, Sharon Henderson, hello. She's knitting her birthday slippers. Her birthday's next Sunday, happy birthday. Claudio, hello from Berlin. And Kathy Mashburn says it's hailing at her house. She lives in the same town I live in. Michelle, hello. She says it's hailing in the Southwest. Okay, I do have a couple books I want to share today, and I have some swatches that I'm going to share. Let's do the swatches first. These are very basic swatches. So this is a garter stitch. Can you see that? Let me turn my light off. It makes it too bright. There you go. Some garter stitch. You know, it's funny. Uh, I'd rather you see the knitting than see me. So I adjust the light so you can see the knitting. But that's what it's all about. Okay, so that's some garter stitch. That's 20 stitches cast on and worked for um, four inches. And then I have this swatch that is stockinette. Same mm -hmm. thing, cast on 20 stitches and worked for four inches and bind off. And then a seed stitch swatch. Cast on 20 stitches and knit for four inches. Look at that pretty seed stitch. I love seed stitch when it's done correctly. And then a knit two purl two swatch. So all of these are 20 stitches wide. So you can see there's a big difference between 20 stitches and knit two purl two ribbing and seed stitch, but none of these have been blocked yet. And that's the reason I'm knitting them because I'm gonna be making a video. I'm gonna knit one more swatch. It's knit one pearl one ribbing. And I'm making a video today on blocking these and how to block them and the differences between the fabrics. And I'm gonna be showing the before and after of the fabrics, what it looks like before it's blocked versus what it looks like after it's blocked. Not only am I gonna show how to block, how to lay them out and pin them so that they look really good, but I'll show the difference in the fabric. So it should be a really good one. I'm looking forward to that one. I love doing this kind of stuff. It's like, it's like chemistry class. I just love it, okay? Yes, Diana Danko says, do you need to reset your moderators for this new channel? Yes, who wants to be a moderator? Who wants to be a moderator? Diana, do you wanna be a moderator? I'm making you a moderator. And I'm gonna make, uh, let's see. Kathy, I'm making you a moderator. I hope you don't mind. Oops, get up here. Go to uh, put in user, add moderator. Okay, and Diana didn't get added. Let me add you as a moderator. Oh, she says she's a moderator. Okay, and Jane, you want to be a moderator? Good, thank you. I need all the help I can get, you know. We don't have any crazies on here yet. And Lizanne. Hopefully I don't pick a, a crazy. Uh, none of you are crazy though. <laughs> Jane Hart, Sue M, thank you. Okay, so we got some moderators on here now. Great, wonderful. Okay, 
Let me see if I missed some questions now. Urgen says, request, could you bring your swatch cuff in for us to see and talk about it a bit? The swatch cuff. Which cuff? I'm not sure which one you're asking. Um, say it again and maybe use some other description to help me. Cookie Smith says, hello, I finally made it to the event. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so those were the swatches. Now I have a couple of books. Uh, people have been talking, the cuff with colors. Is it my swatch with colors? The swatch that I showed last time, the yellow and red one? Oh, the wristlet. The wristlet. I got it. Hold on. I got to find it. Let me find it. I'll be right back and I will get something else. Oh, my other thing too. Okay, I'll be back. Is that what you want to see? Now, I have multiple versions of this. I'm not sure if this is the exact one that I sent to you or not, but it's similar enough that you can get the idea. I think the one you have has uh, corrugated ribbing on the top and the bottom. Uh, I don't remember. But I have, when I was doing this, I made a bunch of different ones. But the color work is all the same in the middle here. Um. So this is worked with a few different colors. I sent this in as a free handout with the people who've purchased the iTag yoke pattern. And I left out a one, the very ending directions. But when I send out the next set of information, you'll get the correct one. I'm not going to send it right now because then it's like spamming everybody with tons of stuff. You're going to be plenty, getting plenty of stuff anyway, but it'll be coming out in real shortly. Okay. But in the meantime, you can work this if you want to. And you can work it with a uh, yarn from your stash. It doesn't have to be this size. It can be any size yarn. And you can just experiment. It has, I think I made some little buttonholes on this end. And you could put buttons here, whatever you want to do. But you get to practice doing the um, steaking, cutting the steak. You make a steak and then you cut it. So that's really kind of fun. Okay. So let's see. I was going to show you also my work in progress. We were talking about swatching in the round, right? So not only do you want to experiment, I've shown you this before, but I'll talk about it again. Not only do you want to experiment with the size of needle and the, the fabric you want for your sweater. Remember, you're going to feel it and see whether you like that fabric because it's all about the fabric. It's not about which needle size you're gonna use or the yarn it's about. With your needles and your yarn, what kind of fabric do you want to create for your sweater? Okay, your, whether it's a pullover or a cardigan. So I am I decided that I like this. This is um, Arakania Huasco, it's a fingering weight yarn. And I'm really stretching it out there. So the, I'm using a US three needle, which is 3.25 millimeters. Then I'm doing some stranded work with Malabrigo Sock, which is also a fingering weight yarn. I think it's a slight different uh, weight. It's not exactly the same as the Arakani Huasco. But the big question here is, when I do the stranded work, will it change my stitch gauge? Because if it does, then I have to compensate for it somehow. I'm going to either have to change to a different needle size or add or subtract stitches. Those are the only two ways that you can compensate, either by changing the stitch count or changing your needle size. And that's what I'm experimenting on right now. I haven't gotten much further than the last time, uh, but I'm gonna work on it some more today. I hope to have this finished real soon because I'm using this swatch. I'm gonna be making a new video on creating steaks, reinforcing it, and then cutting it, okay? 
So that's why we're going to swatch. And it doesn't matter. That's just stranded knitting. I'm also including directions for inserting lace uh, cables. And did you see the little lace with the beads in it? That's really cute. That's going to be in there. Just a um, textured stitch pattern. Like if you want to use any sort of textured knit pearl design that you often see like in Gansies or just, you know, it can be like that a chevron design by changing your knits and pearls or it can be mosaic knitting it could be intarsia it can be anything but you're going to swatch it first because you have to figure out your stitch gauge okay let's see let's see where am i okay so we've got our um Cindy, I'm going to make you a moderator. Mad moderator. Sue him. I thought I added you as a moderator. I'm going to add you as a moderator. Okay. Now. Yes, I got all that good. The stick, the cuff. We got that. We're good. Now, Vicki Crabtree. Question, do you have any tutorials on measuring, let's sit over here like this. Do you have any tutorials on measuring gauge in textured or ribbed knitting uh, swatches? I'm going to be doing that. Actually, that's why I'm knitting these swatches, because not only am I going to show how to um, block them, but I'm going to show how to measure stitch and row gauge on them as well. So it's different stitch patterns. So this is uh, a knit to purl to is representative of a multiple of four, right? Uh, knit to purl to is a multiple of four. So I'll teach you how to measure stitch gauge over multiples in this. Uh, seed stitch is a multiple of two. So you can learn how to measure gauge over a multiple of two. And that should be coming up real soon because I only have one more swatch to knit for that. Okay, does that answer your question, Vicki? I think that'll help you. Diana Danko, if you post a question, Suzanne misses it, don't forget to ask again. Yes, it's much easier than me trying to scroll up and down um, the chat over there trying to find your question. Okay, so if, if I miss you, and be sure to put your the word question in capital letters because it makes it pop out for me, it's easier to see. Lorraine Lapola says, is there a video for sticking? I've never done it before. I have one. It's kind of psychedelic. Watch it. It's really pretty. It just, you know, um, you go to my YouTube channel, the other one called Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, and we'll link it below in this one too. You know, Diana Danko does all my timestamps for me, and it takes her about 24 hours. Once she gets them typed up, she sends it to me, and then I add it to the description below the video. And it tells everything that I talked about in the live stream. And if you want to go to that section, because the live stream is going to be like an hour long, you don't want to like wade through the whole thing just to watch one little bit. You can go to the time stream and just click on that time and it takes you to that part of the video. Isn't that cool? Isn't this awesome? I love it. Kind of like an index in a book, but it just takes you right to it. Okay. So when you ask me a question, put the word question in capital letters, makes it really easy. And I do have that video on sticking, but as I said, it's really psychedelic because the camera on my phone at that time, you know, I do all of my videos on my phone. Did you know that? This is my camera. Everything I do is on my phone. And I use, let me show you, I use this C clamp. It's really basic. What I do is really basic. This is my giant C clamp, okay? I clamp one end to my table. I clamp my phone to the other end. I have a light box that I've made for myself out of cardboard and fabric to create the um, softening. And I use these kinds of lights right here. I have them set right by my desk, see? Everything's like really um, self-made. And that's my setup for making my videos. So. In my camera that I used for that particular video, the little um, thing here had a crack on it and I didn't know it. So it makes very pretty videos, but I don't know that they're useful in learning how to do something. But you can go to my YouTube channel, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, search Steak, and that video will come up, okay? 
Okay, so let's see. Kathy Roosh, question, shall we change needles but continue on the same swatch separated by a row of garter in round or do separate swatches? I would stay on the same swatch and just separate it by a row of garter stitch. And then I put in a pearl bump for each number of the size of the needle. Some people use a yarn over. If you do a use a yarn over, then you got to do a knit two together. So if you're using a size four needle, you can either put four pearl bumps, not right at the edge, move them in from the edge a little bit so you can see them and they're not right on that garter ridge. Move them up into the fabric a little bit so you can feel them. Or you can put four yarn overs, a yarn over, knit two together, yarn over, knit two like that. That makes it for you so you can remember uh, because sometimes you forget. <laughs> I forget all the time. Okay. Sue M. Let's see. Claudio Bueno. Question. Were you ever visited by the wool enemy? You know, the moths. I haven't been, thank goodness. But I have had other insects eat my wool. I think some bees did this um, this year. They come down through the chimney in my fireplace. And I had all of my, not all of it, I had what my current projects that I was working on were sitting in. I have like a window seat there so I could look at it. <laughs> it's right by the seat I sit in. And I found some dead bees in there and I had a couple of skeins that were chewed on. But as far as moths in Bakersfield, we don't have them. But moths are not the only insects that you will eat your wool. Beetles will eat your wool. Um, another mistake I made one time, I made this really cute teddy bear for my first granddaughter. It's great big. It was bigger than her when I made it. And in order to make it sit up, I put dried beans in the base for weight. Well, guess what? Insects wanted to get to those dried beans and they ate through the wool to get it. So the base got some holes in it. So I learned do not use food to weight your knitting. It's better to use glass marbles or uh, anything like that, uh, little rocks to weight your knitting. Don't use dried beans. That did not work very good. So, but so moths are not the only problem. In Bakersfield, California, we don't have wool moths. They just don't live here. But other things will eat our wool. And what they like is food. So if you have something that you're wearing and you get little bits of pieces of food on, even so small you can't see it, and little insects will eat through that to get the food residue, okay? Okay. Sue M says she did a video on how she moth proofs her stash, spinning the past. I have on my other YouTube channel, uh, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, I have a link to uh, Sue M's over in my sidebar of my pre preferred YouTube channels. She's over there. Okay, so I have a couple books that I'm going to show you. Have I missed anybody's questions? I'm down at the bottom of my list. If I missed your question, speak up, okay? First book. I love this book. Knitting in Plain English by Maggie Rigetti. And I really don't know why I bought it the first time, but it was when, during when I was doing the Master Hand Knitting program. The entire book is just words. See, it's like reading a novel. Okay, it's just words. There's some pictures, but it's mostly words. Um, there aren't patterns. It's just about knitting. It's my kind of book. So what I learned from her, I used to have an issue that on the right edge of my knitting, let me show you, when you have, you know, stockinette stitch, and some people get this on the right side, some people get it on the left side. Have you ever noticed if you have stitches, the, the first column in from the edge, not the selvage stitch, but the first column in, helps if I hold it right side up, okay? That first column in, uh, have you ever noticed whether your stitches were wonky? Or it could be the next to the last column. It's not the salvage stitches. It's the stitch column of stitches, one stitch in from the salvage. And they can be a big stitch and a little stitch and a big stitch and a little stitch all down that column. I call those wonky edge stitches. Um, I refer to the salvage as the salvage. And then the first stitch in, I actually refer to that as the um, 
edge because if you're going to, if you're going to pick up stitches along here, that's the stitch that will look like it's on the edge, like along a button band or seaming. Okay. If you get wonky and you may not have ever noticed it because you may not have looked, but if yours are not the exact same size all the way up and down, it can be frustrating, especially once you see it and trying to figure out how to fix it. And usually everything that you try that seems reasonable to you will make it worse. So I had that problem on the right. And um, in the Master Hand Knitting program, we call that rowing out. And it's where you get these gaps on the wrong side of the fabric. You can't see this swatch very well. It doesn't make much sense to use it, does it? But there should be no gaps between the rows right on the edge. Um, different people use different terms for different things. If you have gaps between your rows in the reverse stockinette, I call that gutters. If you have gaps over here along the edge, I call that rowing out. So you can almost, there's a, hint of a gutter right there. Can you see it? That line? Maybe another one down here. There's not too much gutters. If you turn it this way, you can see a little bit. There's one going right here. That's where either the row of knits or row of pearls were a different size, okay? So that's called a gutter. This is very minor. Um, but on the edges, if you cut those, I call that rowing out or wonky edge stitches. So I was doing tons and tons and tons of research trying to figure out and fix my wonky edge stitch. Well, guess where I found it? In Maggie Rigetti's book. And it's the only place that I found it being mentioned. And she's the one that talks about, just like I talk on my videos, only I've expanded on it a little bit. She says, you knit the first stitch of the row normal. You put your neat, right needle into the next stitch as if you're going to knit and you tighten the yarn a little bit. And you know how I tell to do that between a knit and a purl? Well, you can do the same thing between a knit and a knit. And what it does is it makes that second stitch a little bit tighter so that when you come back to it on the next row, it can absorb the extra yarn and then be normal size. And that stops the rowing out at the edges. I found that in her book. Now she has many, 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 many things in here that I love. For example, I opened to chapter one you can always tell what is wrong with the garment by the way the model is posed. So this will change your, your the way you look at things forever. And I'm sorry that I'm going to do this to you, but let's say you're looking at a sweater on Ravelry and it's just beautiful, but the model's hair comes down and is over this part of her sweater in every picture. You never get to see this part of the sweater. What do you think that means? That means there's a problem there. Or let's say they're sitting in some strange, they've got to throw their shoulder way back or they've got to, you know, do something strange with their shoulders or with the way they're sitting, they're hiding something. Or if they always have their hand over a certain part of the sweater, like the bottom of the button band, you know, let's say this is the button band. There's always their hand over it. Or they never show a picture of the whole sweater all together in one picture. Those are all warning signs. <laughs> and, then, and, <laughs> and then I like this statement. This is on page 57. Oh, this is a different book. I'm sorry. I'll go over that one next. Then she goes on. She says, after that, she says, um, she says, gauge can get you. Well, guess what we talk about all the time? Gauge. And then that's chapter two. Chapter three is don't get all balled up in yarn. So she talks about all the different qualities of yarn and the a spin and the plies and all that kind of stuff. So this is this is a really, uh, I think it's a good book to have in your library. This is her other book and it is called Sweater Design in Plain English by Maggie Rigetti. The other one was about knitting in general. This one is about sweater design, and you might really, really like this one. I love the way she talks. She says in here on page 57, I love this, and I've seen this happen so many times. Never give in to the fudge factor. Definition of the fudge factor. I will stop eating fudge and will have lost 10 or 15 pounds by this the time this sweater is finished. So you knit a sw smaller sweater. 
I mean, really, you know, if you it, it, just make it fit you, you'll be more comfortable that way. Don't don't make it for your dream size. Make it for the size you really are. And and sweaters, um, you know, if they're a little bit too big, it's OK. If they're too small, it's not OK. It's hard to deal with that. And you probably will end up not wearing it. But she has lots of pictures in here about body sizes, uh, figuring out your body size, uh, how to measure, all the things that we talk about. I, I incorporate a lot of her stuff from this book, as well as many other books in my teaching. But this is a very, very good book. Okay. I love reading hers. It's another bedtime book. Okay, let's see. Let's see, Claudia Williams, thanks Sue and Suzanne. I'm right here with you. Had to frog a little bit. I'm back on Tony on Wardy. Okay. Tony says, question, knitting the starry, starry night socks for my husband with 80 stitches, which fits well on his leg, but the stitches stretch over his instep. Is it possible to increase only in the gusset area? Yes. So you would just extend the gusset down. The gussets, this part right here, you would continue increasing. I would not I would only do like uh, maybe um, one more increase on each side and then and then try it on. And then when you do this part of the sock where you're you're doing your decreases along here, you would decrease one more on each side to compensate for it so that the foot comes back down to the normal size. That's a very easy alteration to make. Great question. Okay. Another thing that Maggie Rigetti says is that not all designers write good patterns. So uh, this is where Ravelry is really, really wonderful because you can look at a lot of people's projects and see if they've made any comments. And you can also look um, at questions for the designer about the design and see if there's any comments about it. Also, one thing I, I really look at is whether the knitting is on people or just laid out. Uh, oftentimes, there's two reasons why someone won't take a picture of themselves in their sweater. One is they're camera shy, and they just don't like having their picture taken. The other is the garment doesn't fit the way they expected. So I really like to see sweaters on people and of varying sizes. So that helps you a lot. Okay. Also, <laughs> this has this has something to do with what we're talking about. But you know, when you go to knitting conferences, like Stitches West is a knitting conference. It's coming up in the end of this month. In uh, next week, it's coming up next week. Yay! And they always have a couple fashion shows. The one they have a student fashion show, which it's where people get up and model their own projects. So you see real people in real projects. The other fashion show is for the. Uh, brands and stuff that they're trying to um, sell, you know. So they have all these stick figures. They have these women that wear size zero or one or two modeling. It's like, do any of us wear size zero, one or two? Not in real life. I mean, maybe a few people do, but I'd say the majority of people don't. And they don't have any men modeling anything. And so every year we write in suggestions. We want to see real models. We want to see men. We want to see people that are normal size wearing these things. I think it has to do with the fact that the people who are knitting the garments don't want to knit a full size garment. But if you want to sell us a kit for that garment, you need to show us what it looks like on a real person. So, you know, it's my personal opinion. So any, oh, Alistair Kirk from New Zealand, hello. So any other questions? I think there were a couple more on Ravelry. Let me go back and look at that real quick. Let's see. I got to jump around here. So it's okay. I can do that. Questions. Okay. Let's see. The steaking. Oh, the web pages and, and the back of the eye tag. Okay. So Fiddle Beads on Ravelry asked about telling about our uh, Charles and my favorite web pages and whether we would be willing to make a page on Ravelry that 
with them. Yes, that's a grand idea. I do have some favorite web pages. And, and it's hard for me to kind of share them here because I can't pull them up and show them to you. One of my favorite web pages is the knit is um, Craft Yarn Council. And they have the yarn standards on there. That's worth looking at. And I use those yarn standards for everything. In teaching all my classes and everything, I go by their yarn standards. Another one that you might not find so easily is Uni Yang. And she does a cooking one now, but she used to have a knitting blog. And she, oh, on Steaks, she has a great one on Steaks. It's, it's called, I think, the Steaking Chronicles. So look that up. If you want to learn about Steaks, go to uh, Uni Yang, look at, put her in, and because it's an old blog, she doesn't do it anymore, but it'll still come up if you search for it. And she also has a really good one on lace. And each one of those is like five or six segments long. She did it over a period of weeks, but they're both excellent. Anything she has to say is number one on my list. So that's a good, that was a really good question. Then Kathy Mashburn wanted to ask about the iTag sweater. And she's at the point where she's going to be picking up stitches along the cable in the back. And she's still getting a little bit of cable flare there. So Kathy, what I would do along here is uh, measure, you know, you have your gauge of how many stitches per inch you have in your, in your ribbing, right? You already have that. And then measure how wide your cable section is with the ruler. Just lay the ruler right on it and measure how wide it is across just that section, okay? And then let's say it's three inches, and let's say you're getting seven stitches to the inch. Multiply three times seven, that's 21. That means you want to need to pick up 21 stitches between here and here. That's just an example. You don't use my numbers, but that's how you can figure it out really easy, okay? So that means just figure out which ones you want to pick up in. You're going to skip some, but skip them uh, evenly distributed across there. And then it'll look really good. Then there was one more question. And of course, I forgot what it was. Let me look again real quick. Questions. This is from Sweet Jane. Oh, she asked about holding the yarns, and I already talked about which one was the dominant. Okay, so that's all of those questions. Let me get back on here on these questions. I don't know why they're not showing up today. They usually do, but they're not today. Why? Because I have this new channel or something. I don't know. So off the cuff, my channel and live now. And now I can see the chat. Okay, so I'm back now. I can see the chat. Okay, so Knitting Daily Unit. Let me look it up. I'll look it up what it's called for you. Okay, it's called Uni. Let me put it in my show certificate. Okay. Uni. So her new one is Knit, Eat, and Contact. That's not the one you want, okay? You want her old one. And it's called C Uni Knit. That's the old one. Okay. It's uniyang.com, but it's a blog is called C Uni Knit. And she has all kinds of really, really good stuff on there. I highly recommend it. Now let me go back to the chat page. And see if there's any more questions. All right, here we go. Okay. Children models too. Yes, children models would be really good during fashion shows. So Nancy Johnston says, Ravelry comments can be and often are deleted by the designer. I've known of many patterns where the comments that could be considered negative disappear. Yes, they can, but they cannot remove comments from people's individual project pages. So that's why you go to the design you're looking at, and then you go and you look at all of the ones that everyone has knit, and you look at the individual project pages. And you can actually... 
uh, search them by who has the most helpful comments. That's one of the search things that you can do in Ravelry. I use that all the time. Which one is the most helpful? You know, it looks like a little um, lifesaver. It's like a, a swimming lifesaver ring. And you can see which ones are the most helpful. And the designer cannot delete those. So, okay. Let's see if I've missed any questions. Okay, Our urgent question. While you are there with your shawl collar and ruler, how wide is that collar in the back? Good question. Do you want to know how wide it is after I added the shawl collar or the collar before I put it on? I'll measure both, okay? The width of my back neck before I added the collar is eight inches. Um, when I put it around my neck, I think my back neck is like four or four and a half. It fits me perfectly around my back neck. See? That's the way I want it to fit. So, but the collar itself comes out to here. Can you see that? If you had this part for this style of shawl collar, if this, if you had it come up to here, the sweater be the really narrow neck, and then you added the shawl collar, it would come up to your ears, I think. In cold weather, it'd be really good. Okay. Okay. Dolise, I'm thinking about a certain designer. Okay, never mind about that. Claudia Bueno, Claudio. Question, do you find Ann Bud's book a bit confusing? Just knitted over 80 rows to find out I didn't really understand her instructions. I may be getting too old. <laughs> In the beginning I did, but I understand it very well now. Um, she has a system that she uses. And once you understand her system, it goes pretty well. What you need to do is just like any other pattern, before you start knitting, you need to read all the way through it. So you don't go to that part where you're knitting for five inches and you, it goes, and at the same time that you should have been doing way back here, that can happen in her book. So I don't know if that's what happened to you. And because she's explaining a variety, like the different neck styles and stuff, and she has you skip from page 80 to page 83 and that stuff. I actually write in my book, I use a highlighting pen and I actually write move to page 83 right there where I need to and stuff like that. It's my book, so I can write in it. Uh, I hope that helps you, Claudio, okay? Rona, question, no Sunday live next week due to you being at Stitches. Yes, and if any of you are going to Stitches West, I'd love to see you. I'm gonna be there from Wednesday all the way to Sunday about one o'clock. We're gonna leave to come home about one o'clock, and I hope to see you. I only have one class, and it's Saturday afternoon all the rest of the time. I'm gonna be hanging out, out in the lobby, knitting and visiting, or walking around in the marketplace. So you'll be able to find me. I'm tall. I stick up above everybody else and uh, just say, hi, Suzanne. I'd love to meet you and talk with you. Don't feel like you're interrupting me. Okay. Just come up and talk to me. Okay. Diana Danko used to get, okay. Any other questions? How are we doing? Are we doing okay? Are you guys okay with me creating this new channel? Does that work for you? It works for me. And that way I don't feel like I'm bombarding people with stuff. I feel more comfortable about it. When I was doing the live streams on the other one, then I want to put out just a regular one of my tutorial videos. I just feel like I'm sending out too much stuff to everybody. And it's, it's, it's annoying. It's annoying to people. And I don't want to be annoying at all. So that's why I divide it off into this second channel. The only problem is I need to get some subscribers over here. So if you um, please share this and you know, there are people that wanted to be here. We missed some people, right? So, you know, there's probably some people that wanted to be here that didn't get the notice. So if they're your friends, please let them know, share in your Facebook groups, share uh, if you get on Reddit or Twitter or any of those other things I don't, or Instagram or Pinterest. I don't, I'm, I'm busy enough just with Ravelry and YouTube and Facebook, but I know other people use those other social media uh, uh, 
format. So please share my videos. And um, you can belong to both groups, the this one and the other one, the both YouTube channels. And we'll see you next time. I'm going to let you go, okay? I hope you have a really good afternoon. This was, was fun. I think it worked really good. I'll be back here Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon Pacific Standard Time. And I'll see you then. And goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for the first Suzanne off the cuff live stream. Take care. Bye-bye.